Right. I'm pleased to say that the Melbourne Cinematheque is back this year in a full year's <clears> program, <throat> starting February the 8th and uh, running through until December 20th, I think. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking, as I always like to do, to one of the curators of the Melbourne Cinematheque, Michael Collar. Michael, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Hope you've been well. Yes, yes, and you too, and uh, good Pretty to talk much. to you. Good talk to you too. I know it's yeah. a bit difficult, but I've been very busy, very, very I can, busy. I understand. No, I appreciate that. So let's talk first of all before we get into the uh, individual weeks of programming, and there's some really interesting stuff as always. Um, challenges in putting together the whole year's program, focuses, all that sort of thing. Well, the really interesting thing is, and I've noticed this gradually occurring over the last few years, is that there is this um, transformation, change, move over to digital, as, as it, you know, it's pretty much obvious that everyone can see this. But in fact, what's happening is that this, this change is occurring very, very slowly. So, for example, when we get to, say, the Bresson season, I'm going to talk about, um, it was actually incredibly difficult to find prints of things and certainly to find subtitled versions of it. Um, it there was a there was some 35 mil prints around but we weren't allowed access to any of them because they were either pink or in very poor condition or pink in very poor condition or they've been withdrawn because this is now going to be the archival print that they're going to use to you know kind of look after forever but of course, there's no digital restorations, or if there is digital restorations, um, as a number of them had, there's no English translations available as yet, subtitles. Um, and this was occurring over and over and over again. And in fact, the other one, which I found really fascinating, was um, with the uh, Marilyn Monroe season. Um, because I think uh, this is, was actually one of my suggestions to the committee. And I think the reaction was fairly lukewarm. And I, I thought, well, you know, most of these are probably available. But in fact, in Australia, I think there was like only three available. And I think all of those might have been on film only available for the, the National Film Sound Archive. And when we tried to book the other ones, they weren't, even though they were digital and, and, and they've been screened around the world, they weren't available in Australia. Um, and, in fact, the Warner Brothers title, uh, Clash by Night, Fritz Lang film, which is, uh, I think, arguably uh, her her best performance, um, and certainly it is her, in a sense, first real uh, role anyway, um, even though it was available overseas through Warner Brothers, I had a lot of trouble getting it Um yeah permission to screen that in Australia in a digital format. And I think it was, they just got sick and tired of me pushing and everything that eventually it did become available here. Um, and I think that was going through um, the channels also. And and the same with the most of the other titles, or a lot of the other titles belong to Disney. And um, they weren't available here. And and they had to give permission to to, to um make those available in Australia. And, I mean, that took quite a long time. So I find it quite remarkable mm. that, in fact, you know, someone who's a, a real icon and um, someone who you think of, of Hollywood and someone who you think whose films would be readily available, they actually weren't available to screen on a big screen. I mean, sure, you could probably get them to, you know, as a... DVD or, or perhaps as a download. I, I don't even know that that's possible. Um, but they're not, they weren't available to screen on a big screen. And it actually was, we we almost didn't run the season because we couldn't get enough titles, <laughs> bizarrely enough. How bizarre. That's but it. it occurred, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Know. And, and I think this is what's happening at the moment, that there is this real uh, concern about loaning 35 mil prints out because, you know, they're, they're that 35 mil prints or, or one of few and they don't want to... In fact, this was the other one that um, uh, one of the organisations, uh, English-speaking organisations, 
they did have a print of the Bresson film. I think it was Man Escaped, um, but they were apprehensive about lending it out to us because they had lent out another film to somebody not that long ago and the film was seriously damaged. Mm. So they were not loaning, loaning it out outside of America. Um, so, again, we, we had trouble getting that. And, and that's what I'm saying. Th those two seasons were incredibly difficult to put together, even though um, the sources for the films were quite uh, – I, I knew what the sources for nearly all the films were, um, and, and it wasn't that difficult to necessarily cl clear the rights, but it was very difficult to find some version that we could screen with English subtitles. Yeah. That that is incredible, but uh, and uh, I mean I love the way the Cinematheque you you focus on getting film as much as possible and uh, yeah. and so on. But uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting to hear how difficult it's it's becoming. Let's quickly go through the um, the seasons of films and and they're Absolutely. incredible. Now the opening <clears throat> night is uh, February the eighth, and then there's three weeks of films, including. Uh, the opening night, Am Accord and Blow Up, of uh, screenwriter Tonino Guerra's um, films, or the, the films he's contributed to as a writer. <coughs> what made you choose him? Um, that was actually the suggestion from the previous uh, Italian Institute of Culture, uh, the um, director. She actually said, why, why don't you do this? I can give you the money to do it, uh -huh. like that. Um and in fact, then, then of course, COVID came along and made a stuffed everything up. But I, I think also the idea of doing a scriptwriter is actually a good way to, mm. to kind of broaden the horizons. But the, it is interesting because it, in a way, it was really good because Tonino Guerra's is an obvious choice because he's worked with so many mm. iconic European filmmakers, such a large number. You know, yep. there's a that's a fantastic selection of titles, I think. Mm. Um, but, of course, Adrian raised the issue, well, uh, how much input did he have into the scripts? Because a lot of these directors um, write their own scripts, even though they aren't necessarily uh, credited with doing that. Um, and, and even if they don't write the scripts, they rewrite them significantly. Um, and that was an interesting question, I think. I mean, I, I think there are a number of films that... Um, he perhaps didn't have much of an input into. Maybe he was just like a uh, script doctor, possibly. I mean, he worked on 100 titles approximately. Um, I think there was, what, 10 Antonioni's, um, about 10 uh, uh, Angelopoulos films. Um, and then there's a couple of directors where he did you know, just a few films, like with Fellini, Um and, and Fellini was interesting because certainly I think with Amacord, he actually had a very, very great um, impact on writing that film. But I think on a couple of the other uh, Fellini titles, he didn't do so much work. And it was actually quite difficult. And I think Antonioni too. If you have look at Antonioni's body of work, I mean, it's fairly consistent. Um, and it's hard to say how Guerra impacted those titles but of course he did do 10 of the top films for him so obviously they had a very close working relationship and it's been fairly obvious from dealing with the uh angelopoulos estate that um they worked that angelopoulos and um tania guerra worked very very closely together and they're very uh great friends so i think that maybe it works a bit both ways and and of course you know I, there is always this tendency to to downplay the um, role of scriptwriters and for scriptwriters to always say, oh, the director got it, my my brilliant script and rewrote it and turned it into a piece of trash. But, you know, and, and I mean more so, obviously, the, the, the obvious point there is with people who write novels or, 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 you know, the books and then they're turned into films and they're nothing like the yeah. the novel at all. But, but then, you know, when you've got a thousand-page novel, how, how do you make that into a 90 minute film so you know i think it's it's about other things as well it's not about doing a literal translation to the screen yes really is it? Yeah. no it's great you're showing those six films emma called blow up nostalgia from uh, tarkovsky the mate affair the assassin petrie and uh, the beekeeper angelopoulos so that, that's a great start to this year's uh cinematheque then we go on and you've already alluded to the robert bresson season from march the first 
to the 15th. And uh, um, I mean, a lot of the titles I'm familiar with, but there's one I didn't know, uh, Les Anges du Pêche. Oh, OK. Um, that is, that is in fact, his very first film. Ah. Um, and it's interesting when you look at it because it is very much a Bresson film. It's all there. And then he, of course, made Les Dames de Bois de Bologna, which is uh, scripted by uh, Cocteau. And that's, I mean, I, th I think it's a fantastic film, but it's not really a Bresson film. It's it's much more kind of a what do we call it a French studio film. It's more like a a cocteau film. You know, lots of glamour, lots of dialogue. I think he had a significantly larger budget, and then after that, he went back to doing his more austere kind of mm. works that didn't have any stars in it. Because uh, um, Le Dame de Bois de Boulogne has got a couple of you know well known performers and 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 I mean some of his other films have got well-known performers in them as well but um they're they're well-known performers because uh they were in the first film they were in was uh, a Bresson film um yeah. typically uh, Dominic uh Sander in um you know Un Femme Douce which is the first film with screen and um I mean Un Femme Douce is in the, the season because that's quite difficult to see and the other two that I had a lot of trouble with uh, Four Nights of a Dreamer, which is just impossible, just impossible. They've got no idea who's got the rights, got no idea where the where there's a print or anything like that. And the other one's The Devil, probably. And, and here, uh, this is where we ran into trouble with finding a print because I managed to find a print at the Toulouse Cinematheque, believe it or not. I mean, this is how thorough I was mm. in trying to track it down. And... Um, and actually, CNC, which is kind of a suppository of uh, suppository depo <laughs> depository of, um, <laughs> of French films, yeah. um, they wouldn't loan out their print. And the Toulouse Cinematheque said, "Yes, we've got a print you can have, but we need to check it." And then they checked it, and they said, "No, nah, it's really pink. You can't have it." So um, you know, I had to drop that, or well, both of them, in fact. Yeah. Um, and we we ended up with what we had. And even there, there was some swaps and changes along the way. Uh, because, again, we couldn't get prints. Um, you know, we started off with pickpocket to start with and then we thought, oh, we'll, we'll kind of go. Well, in fact, that was a late edition when um, we couldn't get the, the, the two titles I mentioned. Um, and, and that's not to say it's not worth having in because obviously it is. I mean, mm. I think the films we're showing are all kind of, you know, great, great films. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> That's the Robert Bresson season, March 1st to 15th. Then we have three seasons of films featuring actors, uh, interesting focuses, starting off with uh, Tony Leung uh, from March 22nd. Interesting choice. I mean, obviously In the Mood for, for Love is uh, such a great Wong Kar Wai film and Lust Caution, which I really loved from Ang Lee. But uh, what made you focus on Tony Leung? Well, because, well, first of all, he, he is a great star. Um, the one thing that probably could have been a factor in us not doing it is the fact that there's been a lot of uh, Wong Kar Wai films screened lately. So, I mean, those are relatively well known. So, in fact, as you can see, there's only one Wong Kar Wai film mm. in the season, and yeah. that was purposefully. But again, I had a lot of trouble. Um, but here the problem was actually locating who had the rights for the things. Mm. So, you know, we started off with, you know, a whole bunch of titles, but um, it was very, very difficult. And even things like um, City of Sadness, um, the guy who owns the rights for that, you know, I mean, it was almost impossible to deal with. Um, and Cyclo, again, um, it, it, there was this bizarre thing where, in fact, Studio Canal had the rights. So we go to them and they say, oh, no, our rights have expired. You know, expired 10 years ago. So I managed to find who the production company was and I got in touch with them and they go, no, Studio Canal have got the rights on that. Yeah. And I go, no, they don't. And the woman comes back and says, yeah, they do. And I said, well, you need to talk to them because as far as they're concerned, <laughs> they don't have rights. Um, so, you know, and in fact, that film's still open because I, 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 I they haven't sorted it out yet. So hopefully <laughs> by the time we get to April, it, it will screen. Um, 
Okay. And of course, I mean, for me, Flowers of Shanghai and In the Mood for Love are two of the greatest films ever made. And City of Sadness as well, three of the greatest films ever made. So, yeah. um, you know, um, you know, he, he's certainly a performer who who whose films deserve to be shown. And of course, it's getting away from the, uh, you know, running the the old white guys movies, which I guess <laughs> is where Burt Lancaster falls in. But, you know, we've got to run some of those old white guys films at some Fair stage point. anyway. Absolutely fair mm. point. No problem. Now, you've already mentioned uh, Clash by Night, uh, Fritz Lang's film, part of the Marilyn Monroe season yeah. from April 12th to the 26th. Uh, a good array of films there. I, uh, I've seen them all, but uh, they're good choices. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, again, I mean, Clash by Night, uh, I, when we did our Fritz Lang season last year, yep. I tried to get it for that. And at that stage, there was no uh, print available at all. Right. And I think... At about the time the season screened, so mid-year last year, August or something, a, a restoration had been done. And as I said, I tried to get it from Warner and they said, no, you have to get it through the local company. And the local company said, no, you can't get it unless you want to pay for all the money for a new DCP, you know. It's <laughs> like, you know, if you have 20 screenings, you'll be right. We'll we'll get it for you. And I was like, no, we just want to have one. So, you know, we had a, a fight over that. Um as I said, well, gentlemen prefer blondes. Um, is a tie-in with the Acme exhibition. Um, yeah, they've got uh, I think some stuff. Yeah, from the the film that will be in the exhibition. So that's why that's on the opening night. And to be quite honest, I probably would put that on the the third night, but you know because of that it was moved forward. Um, mm -hmm. For me, the the big the big. Um, film was a clash by night but but i mean all of them are very good films and mm. let's face it she's a very interesting performer as well yep. i think um and she's a very much a misunderstood performer um mm. even if you look at you know something like blonde which is a very bizarre film i think yeah uh, you've seen it i assume i have i really i actually liked it i like andrew dominic's film but uh, and anna de Armas i thought was really good in the key role yeah no no i, I like her i, I think there are some really weird bits in it, though. True. The whole thing about the, you know, the the threesome and things like that. It's kind of a bit. It's it's kind of I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the problem I often have with these with these kind of films is that these people have very rich, very complex lives, and yet the filmmakers go off on some fantasy tangent, which is like you don't need to go there, and this is all kind of fiction anyway. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think that in, in a sense, it's a missed opportunity, I think. I mean, I agree. I, I don't think it's a terrible film or anything like that. Mm. Um, and, and I agree. I mean, I think the, the central performance is excellent. Yes. Um, but I just feel like it could have been a bit better. Okay. Really. No, no, Sorry. fair enough. All right. That's yeah. the Marilyn Monroe season, <laughs> including Misfits and uh, Monkey Business by Hawks. Bus stop, uh, really good films. Now, then we go to Burt Lancaster. Uh, again, I've seen all the films, very interesting choices and quite an eclectic range of films you've chosen for him. I know. I It, it wasn't actually... I, I probably went for a batch of other films um, and Adrian was the one who just said, well, let's put let's put The Swimmer in. It's a swimmer as a film that I kind of... I probably have only seen it once, actually, and yeah. I really didn't like it. But I thought, okay, we'll do that. And and the same with the train. I just find that a kind of a fairly mm. obvious commercial thing. But he wanted them in, and I guess yeah. it is uh, John Frankenheimer. And and I I do I do know that a lot of this stuff from the the sixties and the seventies is re, really being reappraised, um, mm. and quite rightly so, I guess. Mm. Um, I mean, for me, Sweet Smell of Success was the one film that really, really, really had to be in the season. Yes. Um, I probably would have put the leopard in, but the leopard didn't quite work um, with what we had. So we went for conversation piece, right. which I don't think is a great film. But, it, you know, again, it's it's a Visconti film and it's, it's it is yeah. a key work. Yeah. yeah. Um, Crimson Pirate and and um, Chris Cross. I Chris mean, Cross. Two, two great films by Robert Shodmack. He made quite a number of films with Shodmack. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, th this was actually Adrian's been trying some of these seasons have been on the, the drawing board for years and years and years. And sometimes yeah. it's got to do with things being available or not being available. Th sure. This one kind of just kept 
kept, you know, it was on the list and then it would always fall off. And it was on the list and it would fall off. But yeah. but, uh, but uh, I think with the fact that we've got, as you said, the three performances at the start, and there's a bunch of other, you know, um, white uh, old men who's, uh, we could do uh, performers who, who we'd like to do retrospectives of and they'll eventually happen. And I mean, they're going to be fantastic. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this is a an interesting uh, selection of things, some of which hmm. are great, some of which probably do need to be reappraised. Fair um, enough. And I mean, yeah. here's a, He's a you know wonderful wonderful performer. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I probably would have put. Um, uh, oh God, I can't think. Oh, uh, uh, the. Um, oh God, I can't think. The Aldrich film on um, about the oh. state the coach. Uh, uh, um, is that yeah. your, no? Um, yeah, anyway, I can't think. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We need to. Is Vera Cruz? Vera Cruz? Is that Vera the one? Cruz. Ah, that could be it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Fifty-four. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would have put that on. Okay. That's anyway, fine. moving right along. May 24th, a special evening of uh, Bill Masoulis films, and I'm so glad that you're programming his films. <clears throat> I know. He's he's someone who, again, has been on the drawing board for quite a period of time. I think he kind of felt like we had a grudge against him, but we didn't really. Sometimes it's just difficult, especially when he's living in Greece for a while. It's been more yeah. difficult to deal with it. But, I mean, he's here now. And it's great to be showing a batch of films by a local filmmaker. Mm. Absolutely, and you know, great I mean, he's that. I mean, he's been making films for a very long time. He too, has. hasn't he? He has. No, it's really, it's been... you know, um, it's really forty years, I guess. Yes. Now, no. I'm not as familiar with the cinema of Tsai Ming Liang um, from May thirty first to June fourteenth. Tell me about the choices there. Um, okay. He, he, he is a, a major Taiwanese filmmaker. Um, and he started off, I, I don't know where you would say a relatively conventional, uh, film with Rebels of the Neon God. That was the film that in a sense, uh, drew his attention to the world, but he's, um, He's he's moved on a bit from this kind of stuff. So it's be, his films become much more lyrical and fantastical and much more experimental with very strong um, gay sub-theme as well occurring. And he's also very, very much interested in cinema. So something like Goodbye Dragon Inn, I think, is was listed by a lot of people amongst uh, their list of uh, one of the great films of all time. Um, and that's basically set during a screening of uh, King Who's uh, Dragon Gate Inn, um, um, and it's the final screening of the film at a cinema that's closing down. So um, it's it's as I said, there's not really a lot of plot there, but there's a lot of atmosphere and a lot of kind of nostalgia there. Um, and you know, he he he's 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 like a picture pong in a way. You know, he's one of those um, uh, Asian filmmakers who are trying to do something different with with cinema um but are saying true to their roots and their their love of cinema as well okay very interesting now i'm so pleased to see you've got a season of peter bogdanovich uh, films from june 21st to july 5th two in particular at long last love which i know has been Almost impossible to find oh, anywhere. Well, you know, it's 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 there's a lot of jokes about that film. I I know. I've read a lot it's about a, it, but it's a, a really very damned film at the yes. time. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I've seen she's funny that way, but of course, uh, what you're screening is something I've not seen: the recut version of that film uh, called Squirrels to the Nuts. No, no, the other way round. Well, I've I've seen it uh, as a title. She's funny that way. In uh, yeah, yeah, but that, that, that's, she's funny that way is the recut version of Squirrels to the Nuts. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. Okay, no. Okay, the Squirrels to the Nuts. So what happened? The studio got this film, right? Squirrels yeah. to Nuts, and it's like let's get rid of all these old buggers oh. and let's just um, you know concentrate on the new and hip people who are coming along. You know, so they they cut out. Um, you know, people like uh, Tatum O'Neill and uh, Sybil Shepherd, oh. and they kept, um, you know, uh, they they um, 
uh, raise the profile of Owen Wilson and Jennifer Aniston and uh, Jim Potts, okay? Um, and so this is actually the original uh, cut of, of the film. So uh -huh. th I think it was discovered somewhere accidentally. Right. You know, it was at the bottom of someone's fridge or the back <laughs> wall or something like that, you know. I, I don't know how. It's some weird discovery. Okay. Um, and so this is, and, and apparently, I mean, I haven't seen this. And, I, and yes, I've seen the other one, which I thought was pretty bloody terrible. Um, so, so. And um, <laughs> you're going to disagree <laughs> with me about that as well, are you? Um, <laughs> no, no, keep going. <laughs> um, and, and people say this is a very good and a very funny film. Mm -hmm. And it kind of really establishes the kind of balance that's lacking in the recut version that the studio put out. Okay. Um, and, and I mean, you know, I, I think that there's some reappraisal going on of his works. And, and let's face it, he was he was another person who was a great uh, lover of cinema and had a great, you know, understanding of film as well. Um, and um, I mean, I, I think that again, Targets is a is a really yes. really wonderful uh, low budget film, and, and of course, Last Picture Show as well yeah. you know yes oh great much. film last picture show yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and and you know he, he he i think he made a number of really great films at the start of his career uh, you know that those two and uh what's up doc and yeah. paper moon and then he kind of faded a bit but you know it's not to say that there's good stuff there too i mean saint jack i think is a very good film yes well. i yeah. fully agree said that well, last life yeah all right we need to move on fairly quickly il dico and yeti uh, a Hungarian filmmaker. I've seen In Body and Soul. I remember seeing that film. Not familiar with my twentieth century. Um, I don't think my I've 20th seen century? that one. No. Okay. Um. Uh, look, I, I can't really. I, I have seen my twentieth century, and I think I've seen On Body and Soul. Yeah. Um. She's. I mean, this is why this season's on. That she's a very highly regarded filmmaker. Right. A couple of her films have have had. Melbourne Film Festival screenings and then disappeared. Um, in fact, I think my 20th century, there was even a print of it here at one stage. So somebody had the rights for it. Hmm. But I mean, it was, it probably did, you know, kind of hung, hung, Hungarian film festival screenings or something like that and then disappeared. Um, I think she's, she's one of the potentially one of the great filmmakers, up and coming filmmakers, even though she's, you know, not exactly a, a youngster. In fact, she's my age, really. Um, and I guess that's the problem with with what's happened to women filmmakers. You know, they've struggled to get together a body of work. Um, mm. and, and this is often why when we have retrospectives of, of female directors, we're down to two nights rather than the three. We'd like to have three, but, you know, we can't get a hold of prints or they haven't made enough films. Yeah. No, no, that's that's yeah. yeah, interesting to hear that. All right, my my Zoom is telling me I'm I, I need to move on. Um, there's a, an evening of uh, a New Zealand filmmaker Marata Mita, uh, which is good to see. Um, and then you've got French crime cinema, ah, Cadiz or and so on. Great films. Yes. So so the 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 logic behind that was it's basically post war p a uh, pre. Mm -hmm. Breathless films, yeah. um, a, a number of which, uh, have, uh, well, uh, we know are very good because they're, you know, like Rafifi, um, Le Trou, um, which is uh, probably not as well known as it should be, um, but a number of other um, crime films that are very, very, very good. So yes. it was an attempt to put these titles together. In fact, to be quite honest, we could have probably had twice the number or three times the number of films Um and we've thrown in some of the obvious directors like Henri Georges Clouseau and um, you know Jacques Becker, who um, and, and Jules Dassin with his Rafifi. But but I must say that Adrian and I have been trying to put an Henri Decoin film on for a, for a while because um, he's a, a favourite of some of those um, uh, Tavernier, especially uh, Tavernier sees him as one of the, the very very great. Uh, French directors, and he did make a huge number of films as well, something like a hundred. And I think there's a lot of terrible films there, but he certainly made, I mean, ten or twenty films that Tavernier regards are, uh, uh, you know, incredibly well made and, and very good. So, yes, this is where we get Razia sur la Schnuff on, which is, um, you know, I don't know Schnuff. I think some sort of drugs or something, but okay. Um, all right, no. let's, let's move on. And we did have a Melville there, but we dropped it in favour of, of these bunch of films. So, 
I understand. So decisions always have to be made. September 20th, yes. excellent to see Lottie Lyle, the Australian actress, uh, and uh, to see Sentimental Bloke, which I'm very familiar with, The Woman Suffers, etc. It's great to see yeah. uh, this retrospective of Australian, early Australian cinema. Wonderful stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, we, 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 we try. In fact, that's our, it's the only silent program we have on all year, which is a bit sad in a way. Yeah. Um, because we like to have several and and i was aware of this all the way through and then others somebody said at the end oh we don't have any silent films it's like <laughs> yeah i know but you know um in fact there was another silent film um because uh cerise put together the uh check screwball season and there's a silent film in that she's always great on that level she always tries <sighs> to kind of find a balance between that and making sure we have a couple of women filmmakers in there as well and you know yes. she, she's she's a very very good programmer i think Yes, um, no, yeah. much maligned. But I mean, the other thing about the uh, the Lottie Lyle season is, of course, it is actually also a Raymond Longford season. They're all films directed by Raymond Longford. That's right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good to see. But, it. Yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Now you know we have the screwball comedies. Che- yes, don't ask which me is about those. a good range I haven't of seen films. Any of those. Yep. Right. Not for me. The Brazilian films. Them. No, yep. I don't know any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the very Brazilian good. films again. Yes. Uh, um. I, I don't really know these ones. This, no. uh, this started off as a kind of uh, um, the uh, Brazilian new wave films um, of the 60s and 70s. That's what we originally wanted to do. Right. Um, and and this has been going on for a number of years. Uh, and and we, we just had trouble putting them together. Um, okay. You know, White God, Black... Devil, um, all, all those Antonio dos Mortes, all all those things, yeah. um, and also I think the other part of the issue was they're actually to do three nights of those films. It would have been pretty dry and pretty hard going. Um, but uh, then we decided to expand it to basically '60s cinema, as uh-huh. as it's called, crime, politics, and revolution in the '60s, and it kind of made it a little bit easier. But it's still, you know, it's like with African films, um, South American films. It's often very, very difficult to get this stuff. And certainly Brazil at the moment, um, with the whole previous government, um, it was very, very difficult. And, I mean, their archives actually closed down as well, Mm. um, the Brazilian archive. So um, we had to find stuff all over the world. Macunema, for example, is is actually a local print. But, uh, you know, the, the stuff we've got here, some of it's from Brazil, some of it's from the UK, some of it's from America, and it's from all over the place and from all sorts of filmmakers. So, again, you know, we struggled to put that season together. Um, okay. And that is really kind of, you know, difficult sometimes. Yes. People say, oh, why don't you do these seasons? And, okay. I understand. Well, Gregory I'm Markopoulos sorry. and Robert Yes, Beavers. four minutes left. <laughs> Markopoulos. Okay. So um, experimental filmmakers. Yep. Uh, they're actually... Uh, Partners in crime as well, a gay couple. Um, uh, Gregory Markopoulos is kind of like the uh, one of the legendary experimental filmmakers, and he he teamed up with Roger Beavers, and they both made a batch of films. Um, I think independent of each other, but um, the reason we've got this season is that actually Robert Beavers is going to be in Melbourne and he's going ah. to present the films made by his his. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, his. What's the opposite of a widow? What's the opposite of a widow? <laughs> now we're getting into politics. Anyway, yes. he won't go he's there. dead partner. No, no, no. He's he's dead partner. Okay, all right, dead that's partner. all I meant. That's know. fine. So I couldn't think of what the word is. All right, I'm moving quickly. Anyway, um, yes, uh, the Tanaka films. Okay, so we did a season of of her films a few years ago where we uh-huh. ran three films that she did as an actress and three films that she uh, directed. We actually managed, no, only two films. No, we ran four films of an actress and two that she directed. We've now been able to enlarge that to four. Mm-hmm. She actually directed six titles. Two of them are Toho films and they're outrageously expensive to, to borrow. Yeah. Um, I arm wrestled with the guy from Toho. I got him to within half of the price that we were willing to, the exorbitant price that we were willing to pay. He didn't budge any further, so that was it. So we ended up with four of the six titles. Um, They're all restorations, um, and as I said, two of them have never screened here before. The Moon has Risen has not 
screened here. I think the Love Under the Crucifix has screened, but not for a very long time anyway. Okay. Um, the other two, Forever a Woman, we screened as The Eternal Breasts, and that is a truly amazing film. Um, and as I said, The Wandering Princess, again, is the, the, all four of them have been restored. Good so stuff. That's now, coming to Australia, women filmmakers, um, Golden Cage, Silver City. I love Sophia Tokowitz's film. Yes. No, it's wonderful. Immigrants. Um, of course, the real motivation there was the people People kept talking about my brilliant career as mm. the first you know, film directed by a woman since the silent era. But, of course, that was totally incorrect sure. um, because, of course, yes, exactly, because um, Golden Cage is the first one made. And, okay, it's only 70 minutes long, but, you know, it, 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 it deserves, I mean, really, here we have this Turkish woman Come, who made this the first film made by a woman in Australia in, in um, 1975. I mean, I, I think it's remarkable. It's just absolutely almost unbelievable. And okay. I think this is the issue, that, that people don't believe it. They so this is know. a very, very rare screening. Absolutely. Um, and it's Eastern just European been Western. restored as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I've got a minute left. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, 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 okay. So the... Um, Eastern Eastern Westerns, or, yes. Uh, um, uh, as it says, Erston Powers. Um, you know, the <laughs> joke. Thank you. Um, in fact, it, it this is a season that was supposed to screen, uh, well, in in, 19, uh, in 2020, but COVID came along, um, and in fact, it was supposed to have a number of uh, uh, Russian films in it, but something happened with Russia. I can't remember what it. It is, and, and so suddenly I think there's still one Russian short or something in there, but but the okay. others have disappeared. I love the German, um, East German Westerns and all that. We've got a few. I've got to say, we've got Western, which is a <laughs> yeah. fantastic film, yes, you know. Yes. Uh, um, and Lemonade Joe is one of those ones that uh, is much more an homage um, and a friendly kind of thing. I, I, I don't really think that's a Western, even though you could – classifies a western okay. uh, i mean it's like the um blazing saddles i mean would you really call blazing saddles saddles a western in a way michael collar as usual great to talk to you about the cinematech uh, and it's a 